Hello and welcome to Social Psychology Chapter 2, The Self in a Social World. Let's begin. We're going to start off by talking about self-concept. This is going to take a little while because a lot of research has been devoted towards understanding how people's self-concept develops and then how it's projected. So let's get started. What is self-concept? It's really our beliefs about ourselves. Now that's a pretty vague definition, but that's because this uh, idea of self-concept is kind of vague. So um, let's start maybe understanding what it means by comparing what we think of as our self versus what we think about as non-self entities. I think it's pretty easy to assume that you assume anything having to do with your body as part of yourself, anything having to do with your own personal thoughts or beliefs or whatever, um, that that's all part of yourself and that things outside exterior to you are by definition not you. Um, so as I'm looking out my window while I'm making this lecture, I can see rocks and trees and hills and I'm pretty sure those are not part of myself. Or are they? Are they part of my self-concept? Do I see myself as the kind of person who lives where there are rocks and trees and hills? Hmm. It's kind of a complex concept, isn't it? So I'm going to get kind of concrete for a second, and this might help you to see the difference between self versus non-self. All right. First off, just a fact, your mouth produces about a liter of saliva a day. So most of it you swallow, either just through a standard swallow that you do you know, normally and unconsciously, or you swallow it with food and drink that you're taking in, things like that. So the vast majority of saliva, you just swallow it and you never even think a thing about it. Sometimes you'll spit it out, but most of the time you just swallow it. Let's imagine that for an entire day, every time your mouth felt like it was, you know, full of water, saliva has filled your mouth, you spit it out instead of swallowing it into a cup. And all day you continued to contribute saliva to the cup. And then at the end of the day, you drank it. I'll give you a moment to cringe. Because that's pretty gross to drink it once it's been out in a cup, isn't it? And it's partly because, I mean, I don't, I don't know how consciously aware we are of the fact that, of course, it's full of bacteria when we spit it out. And then it can just sit there and grow all day. As opposed to, you know, the bacteria that's already in our mouths. We just swallow it and we, you know, we won't get too graphic. But, you know, we excrete it out. And so... It is objectively gross to, to, to drink your spit at the end of the day, but it's also gross because it's no longer part of yourself once you put it into a cup, right? As long as you're just swallowing it in your mouth unconsciously and you don't think about it, it's just part of you. Um, so that's a really graphic example. How about another graphic example? Um, have you ever cut yourself a finger, um, you know, something that you can put in your mouth, cut yourself, and then you put it in your mouth? Right. Like immediately you start sucking on it and, uh, you know, maybe some blood got in your mouth because you put your cut into your mouth. I did just mention all the bacteria in our mouth. We probably shouldn't be sticking our cuts in our mouths, but it's a weird thing. You get burnt or you get a cut and and you mainly put it in your mouth. What if instead of just swallowing whatever blood might be excreted by that little cut in that moment when you pop it into your mouth, we put immediately a Band-Aid onto your cut let it absorb the blood, and then you suck your own blood out of the Band-Aid. You probably don't want to do that either, right? Because at that point, the blood is no longer you. That blood is now something that is attached to that Band-Aid, and now it has become gross. So these are just some examples of how we can start to think about what the self-concept is by starting to eliminate what it is not, right? If it's, if, if, the blood is no longer part of you once it has separated from your body. If the saliva is no longer part of you once it has come out of your mouth, um, you can kind of start to go, okay, well, those kinds of things, I get it. Okay, so that's not part of myself. Even as I gave the example of a rock and a tree and a hill being part of my self-concept possibly, things that have left our physical body, I think we can all agree, are probably non-self. Let's take some scales to assess your sense of self-concept. So it's really important to be aware that social psychology in particular uses a lot of scales to try and figure out where people place themselves on different concepts. So in this case, we're gonna be measuring some aspects of your self-concept. And while it is not going to tell you anything novel or revolutionary about yourself, it at least helps you to quantify where you stand with regard to this 
concept called self-concept. Um, so, and that's what we use it for. What we use these kinds of scales for in psychology is not to give us great insights into an individual. It just allows us to have a way to quantify an aspect of whatever we're studying. So in this case, we're studying the self-concept. So on this first one, you're going to want to number your paper one to 10. So it's a relatively brief scale. So if you want to grab a piece of paper, feel free to pause me. All right, so hopefully you have a paper and pencil and you're willing to play along. It's really hard to keep it in your memory. So it's really the best if you can write your answers down so that at the end you can actually sum them and do all the things that you need to to um, see how you actually scored on the scale. All right, so I'm going to read to you a series of 10 statements and you're going to use this scale that you see on the screen where one represents strongly disagree, four represents strongly agree, two is disagree, three is agree. So we don't have a midpoint. You don't get to straddle and say it depends on the situation or something like that. You have to be on one side or the other. You have to be either leaning towards disagree or leaning towards agree. All right, well, let's see how this goes. So number one, I feel that I am a person of worth at least on an equal basis with others. All right, so just write down the number that represents the degree to which you agree with this statement. Number two, I feel that I have a number of good qualities. Number three, all in all, I am inclined to feel that I am a failure. So I'm reading this kind of quickly. You can always pause me if you're needing to reflect on my question. All right, number four. I am able to do things as well as most people. Five, I do not have much to be proud of. Six, I take a positive attitude toward myself. Seven, on the whole, I am satisfied with myself. Eight, I wish I could have more respect for myself. Nine, I certainly feel useless at times. Ten, at times, I think I am no good at all. All right, now let's do another scale before we score that one. And this one is going to have seven items on it. So number your paper one to seven. So again, I'm going to read you the items. It's just a sample from a larger scale, but I just wanted you to get the, the key points from the scale. And the different items may or may not be relevant to your sense of self-worth or your self-concept. So don't feel like you have to value the things that are listed. Um, so for each of the following statements, you're going to use this scale. So it's a bigger scale than the last time. One means you completely disagree. Two is disagree. Three is disagree somewhat. Four is neither disagree or agree. Five is agree somewhat. Six is agree. Seven is agree completely. All right, so that's your scale. And now you notice you do have that middle ground where you could pick four if you're like, I'm not exactly sure. All right, let's see how this goes. Number one, when my family members are proud of me, my sense of self-worth increases. Two, my self-worth is affected by how well I do when I am competing with others. Three, when I think I look attractive, I feel good about myself. Four, my, my self-worth is based on God's love. Five, doing well in school gives me a sense of self-respect. Six, whenever I follow my moral principles, my sense of self-respect gets a boost. Seven, my self-esteem depends on the opinions others hold of me. All right, so now that first one that you took, the 10-item scale, is called the Rosenberg Self-Esteem Scale. So to score yourself, you're going to reverse the numbers that you, you placed in front of items 3, 5, 8, 9, and 10. So what that means is if you gave, for example, item 3 a 1, you'll switch that to a 4. If you gave it a 2, you'll switch it to a 3. 3 becomes a 2. 4 becomes 1. You'll go through that process for all five of these items. So if you want to pause me, do those little transitions, then we can go to the next step. All right, so now that you have switched the scoring for each of those five items, now those no new numbers that you just wrote down for these items are, the, are your score for each of those items. So ignore what you had written first. This, the, the scores that you just transitioned them to are the actual numbers you're going to work with. So now we're going to deal with the full scale. You're going to take all 10 items, add them up, and that's going to give you a total score on this scale. 
So you have the five items that you changed, three, five, eight, nine, and 10. Sum those new numbers with the numbers that you had placed in front of one, two, <clears throat> four, six, seven. So add them all up, you'll get a total score. The scores, just to check your math, can range from 10 to 40. If you have something that's less than 10 or something that's greater than 40, then something went wrong. Um, and now this is a great example of how we score these scales in a way that makes it hard to really interpret anything about yourself as an individual. Um, higher scores reflect higher self-esteem. So what is higher? Well, college students tend to score somewhere on average around 30. So if you're above that, you're a college student. So that means that you're probably scoring higher than the average college student. If you're below that, then you're scoring below the average college student. Um, so that's kind of how we score a lot of our scales is sort of they're relative, you know, compared to, to the rest of the group. Um, absolutely, if you have a 10, you know you have low self-esteem. If you have a 40, you know you have high self-esteem. So that's a, if you're on the polar ends, it's pretty easy to interpret. It's those of us who are more in the middle who have a little bit more difficulty, right? If you're between 20 and 30, you're like, well, is that high or low? And it's honestly, that's middle. Um, so it's kind of a imprecise scoring, but what we do with the Rosenberg self-esteem scale is we use it as a stand-in for people's actual self-esteem. So we use that number in research to decide if people who tend to have higher self-esteem score differently on some other ca characteristic than people who tend to have lower self-esteem. Now the Rosenberg self-esteem scale is designed to assess your overall self-esteem. The assumption is that it is what we call a unitary concept that you are high or low in this thing called self-esteem without regard for context or subject matter or anything else. It is just what it is. The uh, contingencies of worth scale taps into the idea that there may be context effects that may affect how you feel about yourself in certain contexts or in, with regard to certain subjects. So, um, these are, I, I have provided for you the category that each of the items that you answered represent. And like I said at the beginning of this, the contingency of worth scale is actually a lot longer than this. I just gave you sample items, one from each of the categories. Um, and then in the right hand column, you see the average score for on that category, not for that item necessarily, but in that category for a college student. So the first question was tapping into the category of family support and the average score is 5.3. So if you're somewhere around five, you're probably scoring like a typical college student. If you're much above that, which the high score is seven, um, you are above an average college student. Something below that is obviously below. Okay, so you see the categories are family support, competition, appearance, God's love, academic competence, virtue, and then others approval. So you can see that the people who developed the contingency of contingencies of worth scale thought that your self-esteem might be affected by different kinds of factors and that there shouldn't be a single unitary thing called self-esteem, but that instead how we esteem ourselves may be being affected by, you know, how much family support we get or, you know, our tendency towards, um, you know, seeking out academic competence and other kinds of things. And so um, it's just really important for you guys to understand that um, we aren't settled in psychology about whether self-esteem is this one unitary thing, like the Rosenberg scale implies, or if it is, in fact, um, a bunch of different kinds of self-esteem that we might have. And we aren't really in agreement about whether self-esteem changes across your lifespan, or not, or if this is a stable trait that tends to follow you throughout life. So these are things that we're still working on. And, and the Rosenberg self-esteem scale was designed in 1965. And so this is something that has been being covered, discussed, and, and worried about for a really long time. So um, it's, it's something that we haven't settled and we're still working on. So I used the word self-esteem and it was clearly the name of the first scale you took. Self-esteem basically means our evaluation of ourselves. And so self-esteem can be positive, negative, neutral. It's not, the word self-esteem is oftentimes used as a shorthand for positive self-esteem, right? But people can vary on their self-esteem and it could be high, low, middle, um, and possibly it could vary based on context and time. I guess one of the things that's really uh, hardest for us to understand as individuals is how much uh, our 
personal knowledge of ourselves is inadequate, inaccurate, um, fed by a bunch of different biases, stuff like that. So we may say, I love myself. Yay, high self-esteem. Or we might say, I hate myself, right? And have all these, this poor cartoon character is just being buried by all these shoulds and I can'ts and worthlessness, right? Um, how much we uh, understand about how we regard ourselves um, is kind of, we're kind of, it's kind of surprising how shaky we are at really that, that you would think we would know ourselves the best, but we, we do a lot of things that interfere with our self-knowledge, our real understanding of ourselves. One factor that contributes to our, how well we know ourselves or how we think we know ourselves is how we were socialized. Um, so as we're growing up, we look at the reflect, reflected appraisal from people around us. We notice if other people smile at us when we do things or frown at us when we do those things. Um, we notice if other people give us verbal encouragement or discouragement, right? Hey, way to go. Oh, I can't believe you did that. Um, and it's all sorts of people who reflect their appraisals onto us. And so when we see how other people are reacting to us, we internalize that and it becomes part of our own self-knowledge. We know that Sometimes the way that we act, other people are disapproving. Sometimes the way we act, other people are approving, right? So we internalize those things and then we, it, it starts to form our general self-knowledge about whether our behaviors are desirable or undesirable, whether our self is desirable or undesirable. So it's not like we're working in a vacuum and we're just born with self-esteem or not. We rely very heavily on the people around us. And, you know, of course, it starts with our nuclear family, the people around us giving us encouragement or not. And then it's, it grows, right? It becomes the other, um, you know, adults that we come in contact with, teachers and, and you know, other club leaders and other kinds of um, adults who might be giving us feedback. I mean, it's our extended family. I know from my own upbringing, I got different messages from my parents about the appropriateness of my behavior than I got from my, my grandma and her sisters, right, who are a generation older. Um, I got different kinds of feedback because things that were okay to people of my parents' generation were considered rude to the people of my grandma's generation, right? Um, and I internalized that, that, you know, older people won't appreciate my boisterousness or other kinds of things, right? So um, part of that reflected self-appraisal, we internalize um, that it could be contextual, right? That this same behavior might be valued in one situation and not valued in another situation. And so we start to internalize that stuff and it helps to feed into something that we'll talk about later in class, which is you know, sort of this self-monitoring and this ability to um, to adjust our behaviors and our reactions to, to the... Um, to the to the audience really basically or the situation so reflected appraisal um you know direct feedback that we have gotten from others so the reflected appraisal i was referring to you know sort of we picked up on the idea that our behavior was approved approved of or not with feedback from others it is much more direct they will tell you don't do that or i liked it when you did that or they might reinforce us with you know um stars for behaving in a certain way or deprivation of recess time for behaving in a certain way, right? So feedback can be sort of that learning theory kind of feedback where they're giving you um, rewards or punishments for desired um, or undesirable behaviors. Um, and so that feedback gives us information about whether we should be acting the way that we are. And if we get a lot of negative feedback where we're being punished for things that we want to do, you know, other, we're being rejected or, um, you know, outright punished or, or whatever for our behaviors that we, that are our instinctual natural behaviors, um, that can really feed into the, the poor cartoon character on the bottom who's buried by all of these shoulds, right? That other people have told this character that you know to be lovable to be um somebody to be esteemed you have to behave the way we want you to otherwise nobody loves them you know you can't um things like that so socialization helps to feed our self-knowledge and then also we carry around our own self-perceptions and something that we're going to talk about a lot in this class is a concept called schema some of you may have heard that term before in maybe a cognition class, or maybe you learned it in a, a developmental psychology class when um, you learned about Piaget's use of the word schema. 
Um, they're basically all the same thing. The idea is that you have this in your head um, sort of idea about what it means to be you, right? So you have your own, like your most powerful schema that you carry around with you is your schema of what it means to be you, your own self. Um, so one of the things that's important in the maintenance and the development of schemas is whenever you find yourself behaving in ways that it are discrepant from your schema, like you, you see yourself in a certain way. This is my self schema. I am this kind of person. I have these characteristics. I have these likes and dislikes. I have these behaviors that I tend to, to uh, display. You like all this detail that you have about yourself. When you behave in a way that is discrepant from that schema, which means you're behaving in a way that is inconsistent, right? It doesn't, it doesn't fit into what you know about yourself. And we can all remember sometime, I always feel like it's somewhere between probably 13 and 15 when we had the first big, like awakening that maybe I behaved in a way that made other people feel bad. And my apology to them included, that's not really who I am. The way that I treated you is not really who I am. Um, I remember being in that age group, the first time I ever like uttered that phrase, it's like, the way that I behaved, probably because I got, uh, you know, affected by what everybody else in the group was doing, which we'll talk about as this course goes on, that idea of getting swept up with the group, right? So the way that I behaved is not congruent with my sense of self. Like that, if I had been alone, that is not how I would have acted. Um, and so those discrepancies can be really informative because it actually gives us a little bit of pause because it's like, why did I act like that? my schema tells me that this is how I am. And then my behavior tells me that's how I am. Like, why did I behave like that? So self discrepancies are really super informative to us. If all we had were behaviors that were consistent with what we already understand about ourselves, our schemas would be pretty static. Um, so luckily, we we tend to behave incongruently a lot of the time. And so then it gives us time to reflect and think about that. All right. Uh, I think this is a good time to take a little bit of a break and we will shift over into how we maintain our sense of um, higher self-esteem. So I will see you in the next segment.